Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the book launch for Joanne Bluth's wonderful Christmas treat, Christmas Cupcake Murder. I'm pretty sure, Joanne, that I might have gained five pounds just reading it. It is loaded with carbohydrates, sugar, butter, milk, all kinds of candy and treats. It's just delicious and full of recipes. And Joanne, in fact, has created a special recipe card for our copies, which are, let me see if I have this right, Joanne, Christmas eggnog. White chocolate eggnog cupcakes. Ooh, how about that? And of course they're frosted. So, you know, the more the merrier. Anyway, Joanne um, in the past has published biannually um, little Christmas extra books for her fans, and they're a wonderful opportunity to put in loads of recipes. But there is a story in Christmas Cupcake Murder. So Joanne, let's talk about the story before we get to the food. Good. So. Okay, this time it, it says Christmas Cupcake Murder, but it's an attempted murder, and it involves a man that is a missing person that comes from somewhere no one knows where. It was an attempted murder. Hannah must stop it from becoming a real murder. And she does that by following leads. The man himself does give her as his, he is amnesic and his memory begins to come back, the amnesia goes away a bit, and she picks up clues. And there's a clue in one of the recipes. I think you will enjoy that one. Indeed there is. Um, also, I thought you did a wonderful job with Minnesota as the land of 10,000 lakes, because if you're trying to figure out who this guy is, one way to do it might be to figure out what, where he comes from. Do you assume, because Lake Eden is so small and all, that he must be somewhere local, rather than, let's say, having dropped in from Kansas or New Mexico? We assume he's from somewhere in the Midwest. We are assuming, Hannah, Hannah assumes it's Minnesota, because he does talk about Minnesota a bit. And he has, he, he said he lived on a farm near a lake. Oh boy, that helps in Minnesota. Land of 10,000 lakes, Barbara. <laughs> this doesn't, this is not much of a clue. And, um, you know, and there are so many lakes that are named exactly the same. I mean, there are, I think, 80 long lakes and a whole bunch of mud lakes and uh, just so many lakes that, that are named exactly the same. So even if he gave her the name of the lake, she'd have to check out all those locales to see if she can figure out where he came from. I love that you did the statistics. I think it was over 200 lakes called Mud Lake in and the book. That's true, and actually it was my son John that did the stats for me. He looked them all up on his smartphone. Thank goodness for John. Indeed so. Well, um, let's talk a little bit about Hannah's sister because for one thing, she's really annoying in that she can apparently consume endless calories without ever gaining any weight. Is that kind of a, a, a dream um, person that you've created? To, don't we both wish that we could eat forever without gaining any weight? Oh yes, oh definitely, yes. I mean, I, my grandmother when I was a little girl uh, told me, and would grandmothers lie? She told me that the calories all baked out when she made cookies, and I believed her. So, to this day, I am a little overweight, <laughs> probably because I believed Gammy when she said the calories break, baked out when you, when you put them in the oven. Well, but in this book, they're not only eating baked goods, which are scrumptious, but at one point, Hannah and her sister go out for breakfast, and one of them is eating um, an omelet with cheese and overcooked bacon, if I remember right. Oh yes. So um, it isn't it isn't just the baked goods that fatten people up. Do you think that the fact that Minnesota is so cold really helps? Because I'm, my understanding is that people who live in cold climates burn up a lot more calories than people who live in, let's say, Arizona. 
Um, this could be true. It could be slogging through the snow that would burn up more calories. I'm not really sure. But it also could be that a lot of people put on what they call winter weight. And then, of course, when it gets to be bathing suit time, you know, long about, oh, maybe June, because you want to go in the water in your bathing suit and look good, then you have to go on a, a starvation diet. And that's what a lot of, a lot of people in Minnesota do that. Well, there's an impressive list of cupcakes, variations on Christmas cupcakes, a lot of which seem to involve chocolate and cherries. Um, but oh, yes. Yeah. Sarah, do you want to you wanna tell us a bit about how you develop the recipes for these? Okay, a lot of them are, some of them are cakes that I have developed that you can make cupcakes out of, which is great, you know, because you can. If, if you have a favorite cake recipe, you can usually make a cupcake out of it. The only difference is the baking time, because, of course, cupcakes are smaller. And uh, on all of my cupcake recipes, I give you the frosting immediately after the cupcake recipe. And I do that on, on purpose because I get, real, I get really angry if I'm reading a cookbook and they say, oh, the frosting for this cupcake you can use, and it's on page 512. So you have to go to another page and find the frosting, and then of course you don't have all the ingredients. So I wanted them all sort of together, so you can buy everything together to make this, and then you'll have the frosting too. Well, we've talked about this before, but when I was reading through the recipes, I'm always impressed at the detail with which you present them. Um, one thing you talk about is brands. If you've used a particular brand for something and it's been successful, you tend to suggest it? I do that mostly because, um, just in case you might have a failure making one of the recipes, I want you to know what I used because I didn't have a failure. I test all of my recipes at least three times. Sometimes eh, 10, 15 times if I really like them, but I test them all at least three times. They must work every time, otherwise I don't put them in the cookbook. And then I have my son's girlfriend, Kathy, test them. And if they don't work for her, we don't put them in the book. So this, this is really an acid test of all the recipes. So you know, if you follow the recipe, you know, word for word, and you have a failure, um, check out where you bought your ingredients and what you use, because that could be it. Well, you, you did echo something. I, I've always remembered, I'm sure I've told you this before, when I was first married, my mother wrote up a whole lot of recipes for me, and one of them was meatloaf. And after she'd gone through all the ingredients in large letters, it said, mix with clean hands. And I laughed because in um, a couple of your recipes, you talk about, um, you know, the, I'm trying to remember, impeccably clean hands, mix That's with right. impeccably clean hands. So um, have you run into, um, you know, are you just doing that for sanitation or have you actually run into people who don't wash their hands before they cook? Oh, I imagine there are some people that don't. No, I've never run into anybody that doesn't. But um, yeah, I, I want people to do that because who knows? I mean, if you've just cut up onions, you're not gonna make an inch of fruit cake, right? You gotta wash your hands first. And you don't want like tastes or smells on your hands that will that will get on what you're baking if it's not what you're baking. So uh, yeah, I've, impeccably clean hands are an important part of it. I think so too. One of my other favorite directions in there, and I, I'm trying to remember, but it's one of these things where you're using a mix um, a mix master, as I call it, um, and you start you know with creaming things and then the whole nine yards to go through um, the sugar and the eggs and the butter, butter, I think, and then sugar and then eggs and all. And then the recipe, of course, always has flour. And as one of your directions, you say, don't jump in all the flour at once, because if you do, it will fly out over the bowl and out in the room, and it'll be a disaster. You have to put in the flour and blend it one cup at a time. So have you again had an experience where somebody has 
like dumped five cups of flour in all at once and had a disaster. Like me, Barbara? No. <laughs> Oops. I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay, I did that once. I decided, oh, I just won't turn the mixer on that high and it'll be all okay. And it was not all okay. And I had to clean my whole kitchen floor and the counter and everything. And that is when I decided, you know, somebody else might make this mistake too. There, there are two things that I think you have to be careful of. This is one. Okay, don't add all the flour at once. You must mix it in in increments, mixing after each increment. And the other one is if you're making cookie dough balls. And uh, there are a lot of cookies that have cookie dough balls. You roll balls with your hands, put them on the cookie sheet, press them down just a bit so they don't roll off on the way to the oven. I lost three molasses cookie dough balls to my dog once that rolled off on the way to the oven. And I, I you know, I, I miss those cookies. I couldn't eat them myself. They were down, believe me, they were down. And so I want you to be very careful with things like that. So I always make a note of it and write it down in the recipe. I think that's great. So you use yourself as a guinea pig, and if you screwed up, you try to prevent other people oh, from I screwing up. Oh, I do that a lot, Barbara. <laughs> I have had some colossal failures in my cooking career. I mean, I'll never forget the time I made a tuna hot dish, and I, I oh, well, you don't know about hot dish. Hot dish is a Minnesota word. It means casserole, but they call it hot dish because it's hot when you carry it to the church supper. And you know, and so it's still warm when people eat it. Okay, I made one, I was going to make one, and uh, <laughs> I ran out of crema mushroom soup, and I didn't have any crema celery soup. This is what you add to my hot dish. And I didn't have any cream of chicken soup, so I figured crema tomato might work. Oops. And actually, uh, I called out for a pizza, and that's what we took to the church supper. <laughs> Why does cream tomato not work? Is it the acid quality? Something about, it's something about tomatoes and canned tuna that just don't make it together. Oh, okay. I, I'm not real sure what it is, but it was awful. Take my word for it, you don't want to try. You know, I, have a, I had a lot of recipes when I was young um, in which you can have like all the ingredients on the shelf. And I remember tuna noodle, if you had canned tuna fish and if you had pasta, and if you had a can of some kind of soup, and if you had, let's say, a jar of olives, black olives mm -hmm. or something, you know, you could, you were never going to be caught short if somebody showed up and decided to stay for dinner. You could always manage to assemble something. This is true. You know, off all the dry goods on your shelf, um, which is also a useful thing if you live in an area uh, where the power might fail. So, or if you live in Minnesota where you have blizzards and you can't get to the store. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm way past blizzards. Uh, <laughs> even though I grew up in well, Chicago, I've lived away for so long. But I was thinking about California and the fires, you know, or the people oh, yeah. caught in hurricanes and all. What do you do if your kitchen, your refrigerator and all go down because the power is out? Um, how do you then cook for your family? and? One way, if you have gas, you're still okay. But one way would be to have some substantial dry goods or shelf goods anyway. This is true. This is true. You must always prepare for emergencies. That's what they tell you in California if there are earthquakes or anything like that. Yes. So talk to me about frosting because I need some really creative frosting recipes. I especially like the one at the end, which is the one, I think it has cinnamon trying to remember it's a, yeah. a it was a rum cupcake and it had a cinnamon something frosting and it just sounded wonderful that's right it was a rum raisin cupcake and it was a cinnamon frosting and i i am very very fond of cinnamon it's always been one of my favorite spices so i like to use it in frostings it, it's you know it's a nice little cream cheese frosting which is generally vanilla but I figured why not add cinnamon and it's very good in there and uh, there's no reason not to add your favorite spice to things. No, I think it's great and you also mentioned at one point that it's better to use grated fresh nutmeg than ground nutmeg if you have it. Oh yes. You know if you get the little nutmegs and you have a little, I have actually a little tiny nutmeg grater 
you know, and so you can't. My husband loves to make eggnog, and he thinks that eggnog is absolutely no good unless he can grate nutmeg over the top. Oh, this is true, and I'm glad you mentioned eggnog because that that recipe you mentioned at the very beginning of our little talk, you were talking about the Christmas recipe for the white chocolate eggnog cupcakes. Um, you cannot buy, this one uses commercial uh, eggnog. You can't buy it year round in a lot of places. It, it's seasonal, you know, they call that seasonal and they get it in like about now, October, November, December, up until New Year's Eve and then it's gone. So I included my recipe for eggnog. I've got an English eggnog that's very good. And uh, I included that. So if you can't buy the commercial, you can make that. You can, as long as you have eggs. Does your English eggnog include whip, uh, whipping the whites? Uh, yes, you, you can do that. And it's, it's got whipping cream and it's got um, eggs, a lot of eggs, of course. And uh, it's really tasty, and it's best if you let it sit in the fridge for at least a day. Yeah, Rob makes it, and of course he always adds a little liqueur of one sort or another. It can be brandy, it can be rum, it can be whatever. Now, I, when I was young, my grandmother, who was an old-fashioned cook, she actually wasn't a very good cook, but she could make a killer dimity fudge, which I never see anymore, but it's white fudge, sort of like white chocolate. And she could make a great lemon meringue pie. So you go see where I'm going here with egg whites. Um, but she also made something, either apple dumplings, that, which were gorgeous. Um, and she made what she called hard sauce, which isn't really that different than frosting, except that it's not quite as liquid. But do you, are you familiar with hard sauce? Do you make it? Yes, I make hard sauce. And I also make what I call soft sauce, which is for the kids, because hard sauce has got liquor in it. You know, and it could have brandy in it or rum or, or anything like that. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a good, it is a sauce that you could serve. We used to serve it over bread pudding. And the words bread pudding make a lot of people shudder because they had to eat it when they were kids. I happen to like it. But, um, you know, it, hard sauce is a wonderful thing. And so it is soft sauce. You make it for the kids. And um, then you have two bowls out on the table with your sauces, and one's for the kitties and one's for the adults. Mm -hmm. Well, the hard sauce my grandmother made for me didn't have the alcohol in it, but as far as I could tell, it was like all butter and confectioner sugar and some vanilla. And, oh, Lord, it was so good. Occasionally, when I, not right now, but occasionally when I really feel Christmassy, I have ordered from Fortnum and Mason, which is the great London on Piccadilly uh, food emporium, very famous in Edwardian days, and they will send you plum pudding in their own hard sauce, which is just amazing. Oh, plum pudding is amazing in itself, yes. Right. Although some people think that there's really only one plum pudding which is best around the world. Um, you know, not plum pudding, I'm sorry, that's fruitcake. That's fruitcake. I'm wrong. It's fruitcake, but maybe there's really only one fruitcake ever, and it gets passed around from all the I, people I don't want to so. eat it. I think that's right. I, I <laughs> swear by that, yes. So you won't find fruitcake or plum pudding in Joanne's wonderful book, but honestly, there are some great recipes. Patrick, do we have any questions? Yeah, we do. Um, let's see, Joanne. Sherry asks, uh, who designs your wonderful book covers? Oh, yes. Okay, design. Two people work on those book covers. One is the artist who does the sketches, um, and his name is Hiro Kimura. And Hiro is a Japanese-American who lives in Brooklyn who never had American desserts until he started designing my book covers. And luckily, he lives two doors down from a bakery in Brooklyn. And so the first one that he got was a Chocolate Chip Cookie Murder. That was the very first Hannah book. And he went running down to the bakery and said, do you make chocolate chip cookies? And they said, oh yes. And so he tasted them and then he ran home and he drew the cover. And he's done that with every single recipe. So the Brooklyn Bakery now has quite a, <laughs> quite a list of recipes that they now make, which is fun. And then Hero turns his sketches into somebody at Kensington. It's Lou, and I never can pronounce his last name. Maj, I can't do it. Anyway, M-A-G something or M-A-J something. 
and he uh, he designs the cover and chooses the colors and chooses the paper on the cover and chooses all the little special effects that are in the cover and uh, so between the two of them uh, I sometimes am tempted to eat those covers of course I don't because I know they're paper but gosh sometimes it looks so good now these cupcakes, I would love to do that marshmallow frosting the way that he wrote, drew it, you know, with a little <laughs> Santa Claus and I love that reindeer, that reindeer with the eyes. Ugh. You, you got to you got to see this in order to know. <laughs> they are adorable, and I also like to say I think the size of the books is very very appealing, and this cover does not have one of our usual Mylon covers on it, but if you can see it it really sort of shimmers. I mean, it has a very shiny, satiny finish. It's really lovely. It is beautiful. They, they do, Kensington, my publisher, does wonderful covers for me. I, I just adore them. I have, um, you know, a number of people that are, that are writing in to say how much they love your books and how they've tried and tweaked your recipes slightly um, with some amusing results here. Uh, <laughs> there's a really nice, just a note from uh, Amy who says, my 15-year-old daughter and I enjoy reading your books and having our own little book club discussion. Thank you from Harris, Minnesota. It's a nice little comment. Well, that's so sweet. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Keep baking. <laughs> um, and then I have a couple of people here who've mentioned, you know, your uh, your wry sense of humor and how much they like your hu the humor in the books. Um, so some nice comments about that. And also about the mysteries themselves. Um, where, where, how do you get your ideas for the plots for these books? Are you always kind of keeping the antenna up for interesting ideas? Yes, always. I mean, there are so many stories on the news, so many things in the newspapers. There, there are, there's, there's, uh, it, it's wonderful. You can get ideas from all over the place. And sometimes the characters themselves suggest an idea. Like, I know my characters because I've been dealing with them through, I, I don't know whether this is book 28 or 27, I'm not sure. I lost count, to tell you the truth. But um, the characters sometimes, because of their occupations or because of their hobbies or something, will suggest a murder. And then, of course, they're the ones to find the body, which is always fun. It's, I think, time for Hannah's mother to find another body soon. Do, do the do the particular demands of each dessert does that play into the plot at all you know how you come up with a murder plot well this time it did in this book Christmas cupcake murder um, yes the recipe did play into uh, the clue that caused Hannah to solve the whole thing yes and this is this was this was fun for me because I I don't think I've done that before with a recipe, not, not the way it happened this time. And I was really happy it happened that way. Sometimes I don't know what's going to happen. I'll be writing away and then I'll think, oh wait, I've got it. I know what's going to happen now. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of, it is a matter of outlining and plotting, but it's also a matter of serendipity. Sometimes just something hits you like a lightning bolt and you say, Oh, I want to do that. I'm going to do that. And you do. Uh, okay. Uh, Katie Lewis asks, um, who, do you have a favorite Lake Eden character? Yes, I do. I definitely, you know, now that I'm, it took me a minute because I was thinking about all of them. And yes, uh, I, I think Grandma Knudsen is my favorite Lake Eden character. She is so funny. Grandma Knudsen is the Lutheran minister's grandmother. And she says whatever is on her mind. Recently, she got hearing aids. And she says it's very interesting because she could write a gossip column, you know, for the Lake Eden paper now. <laughs> if people talk in front of her, they don't think she hears, but she does. <laughs> Grandma Newton's fun, yeah. Here's an interesting question. <clears throat> Sherry asks, uh, let's see, 
what are some of the most challenging things about writing your books and uh, and and what are the some of the most rewarding things well the most rewarding things about writing a book is finishing it definitely <laughs> I always feel so good when I when I am able to type the end and everything has turned out the way I wanted it to turn out um, frustrating things oh along the way of course there are frustrating things sometimes you're like oh why did I write that how am I gonna get out of this and sometimes it's your main character like Hannah I go uh oh I, she got herself into trouble now how how am I gonna get her out of it this time so there there are a lot of ins and outs about writing but it is it's a journey and it's fun and I do enjoy it so very much well, you must or you wouldn't keep doing it because you've written other books before Anna Swenson, so you're up in the 30s in number of books you've published. Oh, more. Yes, I am. <laughs> Very true. I, I don't count anymore. It makes me feel too old. <laughs> well, that's true. You did. You published a number of, of a little bit slightly darker uh, thrillers, right? Oh, yeah, they were pretty dark. And then how did you happen to come across the idea? The first one was the chocolate chip cookie murder, right? Yes, that was the first Anna. Yeah. How did you happen upon that uh, serendipitous idea? Well, I had been writing the thrillers, and the thrillers were very scary because I was involved in the plot. When I'm writing, I am involved, and I care about the characters, and sometimes I had to kill them off, and I would feel terrible. I'd cry. You know, it would make me feel so... Sometimes I couldn't even do it, but uh, it, it would be very scary, and... I would wake up with nightmares and my husband would I would scream in the middle of the night and he'd switch on the light and he'd say what's wrong honey I'd say oh I think it's a book I'm writing I, I had this terrible nightmare and he'd say it's okay it's all right I'll leave the light on I'll go make you a cup of hot chocolate and this happened like two or three times for each of the thrillers that I wrote and finally I had I was in, smack dab in the middle of the 10th one. And ah, I, I had another nightmare and I woke up and I was screaming. And he said, hmm, another my, nightmare, dear? And I said, yeah, I think it's the books I'm writing. He said, okay, I tell you what, I'll leave the light on. I'll make you the hot chocolate. But please, honey, can you write something else? And I switched to Cozy Mysteries because I don't have nightmares. Except for the only nightmare I've ever had writing the Hannah books is Hannah runs out of chocolate chips. <laughs> that would be a nightmare, especially if you were snowed in and couldn't make it to the store. How grim. So um, is there another question? Yeah. Um, well, uh, just a comment. Somebody says, John says, please marry Norma and Hannah soon. I think you get that a lot, I'm sure. I do, and people are kind of evenly divided. A lot of them want Hannah to marry Mike Kingston, you know, the detective, and others want her to marry Norman Rhodes, the dentist. And so, I don't know, she's, she hasn't told me. You know, she, she loves both of them. She thinks they're both wonderful. And it's really fun for Hannah to have two boyfriends, so I don't know if she's gonna get married anytime soon. If it's not broke, don't fix it, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, Patrick, if I tap this, will the new book come up? Uh, or Look on the screen there, or on, on the computer screen. Yeah. And the, the, the menu should come up on the on the right, allowing you to scroll down. No. Not? Okay. All right, I'll do it. Oh, oh, wait. I see. Over there, maybe? Yeah. Let me try that. But, no. You're going to have to do it. Sure. Sorry. Ah, there we go. Oops. There we go. All right, so we have brought up triple chocolate cheesecake murder because that is the last Tuesday in February. Hannah Swenson, when with luck, we will see Joanne back here at the Poison Pen. And uh, once again, one of the great things about doing an event with Joanne is that she always brings food. 
Uh, usually the food that's in the book. We had a wedding cake, we had a memorable coconut cake last year, wasn't it? When we had the fabulous yes. coconut cake for Arcadia Farms. Right. And while you all can't see it, uh, we have a beautiful table set up over here with some of the cupcakes and some champagne flutes and so forth. And I would like to let you admire my apron, which um, I think is absolutely wonderful. So when you come to Joanne events, you not only get Joanne and a lot of fun and a book, but you get food and very often swag. So it's well worth your time to plan to make a trip to the Poison Pen for Joanne. We'll see how it goes in February, right? Absolutely. Come down and see me. I will be here. Excellent. Well, we will too. Because uh, we often book, we actually book February right around here because you're just like a clock ticking in on the last Tuesday in February. Oh. This has really been a treat, Joanne. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to move on to do a masked signing where a few people are going to come into the store and have a chance to grab some of the food and the swag and talk to Joanne. It's an experiment. Um, and, and I said um, in an Instagram post that I did, this is the night we find out whether the cozy will trump politics. So we'll let you know. Oh my goodness. Goes. <laughs> I know. Well, well put. It's wonderful. Thank you all for joining us. Um, please uh, order an autographed copy of The Christmas Cupcake Murder or buy it wherever you choose. And um, have a wonderful holiday season. Night. Night.